You have a goal and you have an end with a landscape. It's a matter of putting it together. With abstract, it could never end. I mean, you, you can go and go and, it, and you'll change the painting and it can keep changing. I finish a painting and I'll hang it be, because I know in my brain that it's not quite there and I don't know why. And I'll walk past it for like two, three weeks. And one day I look at it and I know what's wrong. I have Martha Braun on today. Hi, Martha. I'm having my first cup of tea here. Hi, Mark. So what do you think? You've been, I've been wanting you to do a podcast for a while. It's not so hard, huh? No, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> You're on now. So how are you doing? How are things I'm, in your world? I'm doing well. Um, I've just decided that I'm probably going to do some teaching now again. Oh, that's um, cool. Yeah, because I've had a number of my old students know I'm back in town. And um, there's a new place in town. I was looking for a studio because yes. I'm still painting at home and it's really small. So I'm looking for a studio and I come across this thing called Catalyst. Do you know it? Yeah, this is a thing in like the Tucson Mall or something yeah, like that? Yeah, it's in the Tucson Mall. They took over 14,000 feet. It was a, the old gap space. And the Tucson Mall partnered with them, gave them the space, did the um, build out for them uh, because they're encouraging since they're losing, you know, they're losing stores because of the internet. So they're encouraging other people to come in. So it's very cool. Um, it's basically an arts center that artists can rent by the month, by the year, by the day, whatever, to do their thing. So there's a recording studio, a painting studio, and they're big, big studios with tall ceilings. Um, there's a kitchen and they do events there. And then there's some offices, but they haven't done artist studios. So that'll be the next thing they do when they move into the space next door. So I'm really, ja I'm really jazzed about this because I can have like six students at a time and spread them out in this humongous room so that with COVID, um, we're meeting standards, you know? So right now I'm recruiting my old students and some new ones. I'm gonna and start so that in Is January. it open now? Is the studio portion open now? Yeah. It so is. if anybody wants to go see it, they should. It's pretty cool. Yeah, so this is Tucson um, Mall. Mall, right? On mm -hmm. Wetmore, you know, Wetmore and Stone. Yeah. See, yeah. that's it. Artists are doing the heavy lifting again, right? So other well, things go away, you know, Gap goes away, all these stores yeah. you know, go bankrupt, but artists are still creating. And I right. think it's kind of interesting. They're coming back to the creative zone to try to, that's the right. well that never goes away. Well, Tucson needs this, you know, we don't have that, an abundance of art studios or places for artists to teach or paint. Yeah. And so, they also have recording studios, right? Yeah, they do. They have a big recording studio and um, some big name people have been there. Um, the woman that does puppets for like Sesame Street or whatever, she's mm -hmm. going to be doing a thing there for a month. There's a guy that um, works for the Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation in Phoenix, Tally Essen, and he does sculpture and he's doing a big sculpture project there and it's going to be shipped to Madrid. So there's people that are, you know, pretty well known doing stuff there. Yeah, like yourself. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Yeah, let's find out about yourself, by the way. Okay. So, I, you know, I've, I've represented you for what now, about six years, maybe? Uh-huh, I'd say. And, um, but let's go back to where you came from. You, I know you went, I, I did a little, I rubbed your biography, which is always helpful. Um, <laughs> but, and I, and I know you went to Wisconsin for graduate, to graduate, but where did you grow up? I you grew up, up in Madison. Madison. You did Wisconsin. grow up in Wisconsin. Yeah. And then I went to University of Wisconsin. And so and what did I, your mom and dad do? What were they doing? And uh, My father owned a restaurant and bar and my mother was a, uh, worked for the school system. Uh-huh. What was the name of the bar? Um, the Union House Tavern. And did he do that his whole life? He went to medical school yeah. <laughs> and dropped out. <laughs> when and why did he drop it, out? Well, I don't I'm know. curious. I have no idea. Doesn't want to talk, talk about that. 
mistake, oh. you know, and yeah. went into business with his two brothers and they ran that place. But it was kind of an interesting thing because the Union soldiers in the Civil War owned a building on their property. They had about an acre in town, downtown, sort of, mm -hmm. um, where they used to come and get their pay. And so it was called, that's why it was called the Union House Tavern. Because the so Union soldiers. As long as you remember growing up, he was working in that, he was yeah, running yeah. that bar and restaurant. Yeah, yeah. And so did you, you must have had to work in there, right? Bus tables, hostess. Oh, no, but I learned how to play pool there. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And so, <laughs> and um, my mom was kind of the artistic one. That's where mine comes from, I think. So from an early age, she had me moving furniture around in the house and doing wallpaper and painting. So I kind of grew up with that thing. And then um, I should have gone to medical school. That was really my, that was really my interest. But, you know, back in those days, I'm old now. The parents, some parents didn't really encourage their children in that way, you know, and, and it wasn't done like we do today. So um, what was the other thing that interested me was architecture and interior design. Mm -hmm. So I went there and I got a, a split degree in interior design and art. Well, so I, you, before you got there, were you doing, were you making art? Were you doing art as a kid? Uh, Drawing, well, painting, in, that kind of stuff? In high school, you know, yeah. You know, in high school, I always took the art class. I didn't paint. I did all kinds of stuff, you know, just trying to figure out what I was interested in. And did you have an aptitude you, at that time? Yes, you think? I did. You did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you didn't consider going into that at that at that moment. No, because I, I like art, no, art. because really, honestly, to be honest, while I love my painting and I, I love the challenge of it, I'm kind of a pragmatic person and um, I knew that I had to make a living or I wanted to be able to support myself, make a living in my life. Right. And um, interior design, you know, if you own your own business can be quite lucrative. And that's what I wanted to do. So I did art on the side, knowing that someday I would probably go back to it. And so you, know. you go to Madison, right. Wisconsin, and what year was that that you started college? Really, you want me to say that? How old I am? Well, let's just put it this way: Was the Vietnam War going on at that time? Yes, yes. Okay, and so how, I was. That's really I what I'm trying those, to get at. And uh -huh. I was, a, and I was an art student and kind of a bit of a rebel. And yeah. um, you know, we protested the war. And um, I remember specifically that we had the National Guard on our campus, um, and they shut the campus down. And I had to graduate a semester late because everything was shut down. Because they were, what was Because the protest, Abby yeah. Hoffman, Chicago 7, all those guys were there. Uh, Kent State happened at that time. There was right. a lot, lot going on, you know, never has it been like that, right, since. Right, and how do you think that might have affected you as far as your, your worldview and things that are going on now? Well, you know, I think as a young person, well, everybody was against the war that I knew, of course, and n not only students, many people, right? But I think the student movement there, big, it's a big school, 60,000 students at that time. Right. Um, it's probably bigger now. I think the students really influenced their parents because even if my parents weren't against it, they were by the end. We got tear gassed in the student union one day, I'll never forget that. And the riot people, the riot police were there in full, you know, masks and stuff. Right. And that was pretty scary experience. So the union, student union is on the lake. There's a lot of beautiful lakes in Madison mm -hmm. and it sits right on the lake. And so you couldn't go out the front door or you got put into the paddy wagon. Honestly, they were arresting anybody. Hmm. So um, we went around the lake to, to where we lived. I remember that distinctly. Yeah, that's a weird thing to be gassed while you're a student in a student. Yeah, house. I mean, tear gas, it, you know, really, I've had the effects of it. It was terrible. But anyway, so I decided that I needed to have a career where I could, you know, earn a living. And I'm kind of an independent type. And, you know, you never know what happens in your life. So you want to be prepared. That was me anyway. Yeah. 
Do you think some of that came from your family too, from your father, especially my mother was, business? well, maybe. Yeah. So entrepreneurial was kind of in my blood. Yeah. And so when I graduated, um, I left Madison and um, which is a beautiful place to grow up. And it was a good childhood and a good college experience, really. And what was it? What was your degree in? Uh, I had a split degree, a Bachelor of Arts in Interior Design slash Architecture. And um, I didn't have, you know, I didn't do a full fine arts where I did all studio art. I didn't specify into that, but that was my second, you know, secondary degree. Yeah. And so you you graduate, you're this young person and you have a degree and you're going to go say uh, Interior Design is where I'm headed. Yes, you're right. So... Um, a friend of mine moved to California, a good friend, and um, she said, come on out here. It's cool. It's San Francisco. It's cool. I said, well, okay, what else have I got going on? I didn't want to stay at home. I didn't want to stay in my hometown. Right. Although I could have had a job there. I was offered one, but I, no, I wanted to, you know. So I got on a plane. And I went to San Francisco, and I remember landing in the fog, and it was coming over the hills in Millbury there or whatever. And I looked at that and I thought, oh my God, what is that? I mean, uh-huh. is this a tsunami? What is this? And I said to the person next to me, what is that? I was scared, you know, it was really yeah. weird. It's, it's humongous and it's big and it's coming over the hills. Oh, that's the fog. <laughs> so um, anyway, so I, I stayed in Palo Alto. Her husband was doing um, um, a professorship at um, Stanford. So I stayed with her in Palo Alto and I got, you know, at that time, I had no idea. I mean, I was very naive in some ways, you know, coming from Madison to San Francisco that, oh, I thought I would just land a job, no problem. (laughs) Well, that wasn't so easy. It wasn't so easy. So I ended up doing some menial interior design drawing, you know, drafting for a firm that did the Fairmont Hotels. Mm. So that was my first Thing. And then I had an interesting thing happen. So that was boring. You know, I was in a little room drafting curtains or whatever, floor plans. So I, re- I heard about this company, small company that was looking for somebody. And so they did at that time, passenger ship interiors, right? So um, they hired me And um, it was a small firm in a beautiful Victorian home um, in in the city. And in its day, it had been um, a very she-she interior design firm and a lot of European antiques. They had this whole house filled with European antiques. So I learned a lot about European things, interiors and antiques. And, um, but we did passenger ship design. And in the dur- during the war, this firm did um, they did something with ships during the war. And so my job was with my boss, who was a character German. Um, we would go down with hard hats on to this to the dock in San Francisco when the sh- when the passenger ships it was called Grace Line. When the passenger ships would come in at night, and they we would do all our work overnight. I mean, the, the carpet layers, the, the uh, wallpaper guys, the painters, the furniture deliveries all happened in the night because it, was, it wasn't in dry dock. It was just between trips. Mm-hmm. So when everybody, and, and so the ship would be emptied for three or four days before the next trip went. So there we were for four or five days, actually, getting these public rooms done. And then we would work on the state rooms as we could fit them in to the schedule. So that was my job. I had to go down there with a hard hat on and and the longshoreman. And the first day I wore my little skirt, you know, and then they carried on at me. So I had to wear pants after that. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure. Longshoremen in San Francisco, even at that time, I'm sure were, you know, a little uh, gregarious. You know, it's funny. Dixon did, I think it was for Grace Lane line. uh, Oh, really? He did some murals. Yeah. Yeah. In the 30s. They don't exist anymore. But there yeah. were there were three, three ships, like something Maria, Santa Maria, Santa Lala, and you know I don't yeah. remember them anymore. So anyway, so I did, did you, that. Yeah, how long did you do that job? For five years. 
Yeah, it sounds like a and fun job, did, actually. And then I did, because this firm was well um, known in their, in their day, they were tied in with the 49ers. So we did high-end residences like the owner of the 49ers and stuff like that. So I learned a lot. And that and the, that that firm sponsored me to to join ASID, which is if you're going to be a serious interior designer, you're that you're you're a member of that. So that was hard though, <clears throat> a lot of studying. And then I had to take a huge exam. I think it was a three day exam, um, which I passed. And then I got my credential. So um, I, in my career as an interior designer, which then spanned thirty years. Mm-hmm. It was important to me to, like an architect would be AIA. I, I needed to be a professional. You know, I mean that that's kind of who I am. I didn't I don't fool around with things. I <laughs> I want to be the best I can be. Sure. Well, that makes sense. I think I think a lot of people want to do that to succeed. Yeah. So, so um, anyway, go ahead. Yeah. So you do that for five years, right? You yeah. Be, yeah. You get certified. Yeah. And then at some point. Well, what was your next job? What was your next <clears throat> next job? You started your own firm? My next job was I told my boyfriend, I'm going to Europe. Well, oh. he worked <laughs> he this is he worked for Xerox in the city. And um I wanted to go to Europe and I had nobody that I could find to go with me. So I went by myself. Of course, in, in those days, you know, it was very different than going to Europe by yourself now or even 20 years ago, um, it was safe, you know. So I got myself an airline ticket and a year rail pass and away I went for the whole summer by myself. And it was the most, uh, how can I say this? I grew up there, mm. you know, I did. And you were mid-20s at this time? Uh, I was, yeah, like 24. Mm -hmm. So then, then when I came back, um, I got married. To the boyfriend? And, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, the boyfriend and um, the first husband. Oh, I only have two. I don't, you have to qualify that when you say the first husband. You never know how many she's had. Right. Um, but that was my first husband. So, um, and then we traveled some more in Europe. I got him to quit Xerox and he wanted to anyway, so we traveled for about four or five months. Then we came back and we opened a B and B in Tahoe. Why Tahoe? Because we like to ski and it's beautiful, and we wanted to do that. Just lay back for a little bit, you know. Yeah, I get that it. didn't last very long though, because he was a workaholic and I was bored too. So we yeah, came back to the Bay Area. You skied all you needed to ski, and then it was time to get back. Yeah, and we ran this little B&B. &B. We had a cute house there. Well, it wasn't small. It was, we had four bedrooms that we could rent out. So we did that. And um, well, let's see what happened after that. Uh, oh, then I went for, to work for another firm in the city, uh, did office interiors. Um, but that didn't last very long because by then I wasn't getting paid enough in my mind. Interior designers and architects are very poorly paid. They're like drafts people, you know? Mm. And so the only way to make any money is to have your own thing. So I said, that's what I'm going to do. And so how did I start out? Oh, well, so I did a showcase in Marin County. We lived in Marin County now in Mill Valley. I did a, a designer showcase with a friend and, um, it was a big hit and she was a flight attendant. So she already had a job. So I started out on my own and um, it, it took off. It, you know, whenever you start your own business, you, you can count on two to three years startup. I mean, it doesn't just, you know, right. and I had, a, I had to give my services away a little bit. Um, not that I didn't make any money, but you know, to get going. And then once people see what you can do, then you're in demand. So then my career took off from there, my own business. And did you specialize in any certain field like European styles or modern or, you know, was there an area know. that you were known for? I was living in Marin County, which is kind of like Westchester County. I don't know if you know mm -hmm. it, but it's yeah, a I pretty do. wealthy group. And 
Very well. Um, so my clients were that. And um, I did everything, you know, contemporary, some traditional, some um, eclectic. My favorite would be eclectic, mixing antiques, real antiques with um, contemporary art, for instance. And were you, um, would you be making those decisions on what kind of art that, that would go in their home? Yeah, with the client, you know. And there must be some clients that just didn't have a clue and they said, well, you do it. Well, yeah, I mean, but I always took them with me because like I say to my clients in the beginning, I'm here so that you don't make a mistake. You go to a doctor and you listen to what he says, but you ultimately decide if you're gonna have that operation or whatever. I'm here to lead you down the right path. I'm here to tell you if I think you're making a mistake, but it's your money and you get to have what you want. But I will always tell you what I think. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of an attitude made people comfortable. Knowing that I wasn't gonna push anything on them, yet I would speak up and tell them. I'm not a yes man, that, that would be one thing. Yeah, I know that, <laughs> <laughs> just so I know about you. Did you ever get to go get a client in Marin that says, oh yeah, I wanna look at Wayne Tebow's or some of these really phenomenal San Francisco Bay Area uh, artists? Cause there was some phenomenal art. Um, I, had, I had one client that's very interesting down in Hillsboro, which is in the peninsula. Mm -hmm. And they at the time, and this was many years ago, there was a magazine called PC, PC Magazine or something. And they were the editors of it. So they had a lot of money and uh, they were very interesting people. And she went on her own to Santa Fe. This is pretty interesting. And she came back. I don't know how much she paid for it, but she came back with a Georgia O'Keeffe. Where she bought that, I don't know. You would know. Yep. But there would have been only a few places probably. Well, it depends yeah. when it is. She could have got it from Georgia O'Keeffe too. I don't Georgia know. Still alive. But she came back with that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, <laughs> that, and did you get to help her on any of the other art? Did they go around the bay? Uh, no, or? she was the type that um, wanted that, to do that on her own. And I encouraged it. Yeah. Of course. I mean, they would run it by me and say, do you think this is awful or do you think this will work? And I would say yes or no, you know. Right. So. I mean, art's so personal. I, it, I always find it interesting that an interior designer could make the choice of the art, but I do know it happens. And, and I, and I've helped people make the choice for art because they, they can't decide or they don't know. But I do find it interesting that such a personal uh, piece to buy that someone else. Right. I mean, that that's person. why I would never try to guide my clients when we would walk into a gallery about what they should like. They could ask, they would ask me, well, what do you think? But I wouldn't say this is what you need to have. Right. Because you're right, it is a totally personal thing. Very much so. I mean, you know, yeah. even in my own sales, I've noticed over the years from the galleries, you know, if somebody were to say to me, well, what is, what is your style? Well, obviously I'm abstract, but I do paintings. Hmm, how can I say this? My range of paintings. Like I have one here behind me, okay? My, my work is basically purely abstract. It comes from my head and that's it. It's not coming from any other source. In other words, I don't take a photograph of a mountain and abstract it. And what I like about abstract, people think, oh, I could do that, right? And I always say, oh, well, you should try. Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. It's let's really, try it. It's really difficult. It is, it is really difficult. And that's why I like it because as we get older, even though I'm not old, but as we get older, we need something to do with our brain that keeps our brain in shape, right? And you could play cards. Well, I don't do that. Or I suppose you could, um, I don't know what, but abstract painting to me is a real challenge for my brain. I have to think so much on a painting because unlike some abstract painters who copy others, like there's many people copying, oh, I don't know, all kinds of artists out there. Um, like, you know, um, in the museum there where I had that show and I hung next to, what's his name? Um, 
Rothko. Yeah, I was going to say you were next to an O'Keefe and a Rothko. And a Rothko, right. So Rothko, you know, did those large field color paintings. Right. Well, there's many people out there doing abstract work that are mimicking that. Well, when I started to paint, are you interested in that? Of course. Okay. I, well, one, I show your work. So yeah. it gives me an insight to how you think and what the work comes. Okay. And, but I know, I know like Diebenkorn has, was a, is an influence. Diebenkorn and how that happened, I guess was, and this is a true story. I've been painting now 20 some years full time, right? right. I retired from interior design. We moved to Santa Fe. Yeah, we no, why did you retire? I'm interested in that component of it. Because you, do, <laughs> you, you, you are a, a very successful interior designer in San Francisco with your own company. And you did that for right. what, 20 years? 25 and then the last five years I was building spec houses. Mm -hmm. Now, when I say that, I put the team together. We had a group called Renovations Development Group um, in, in the Bay Area, in Marin. And um, I worked for a lot of, in the end of my career for the last five years, I say I worked for a lot of builders, spec builders. And I would do all of these selections for the interior finishes, I'd even get into exterior colors for the houses, all kinds of stuff. And sometimes I'd stage them too, you know, because these are spec houses for sale. Right. But I had a bunch of different builders I worked for. And um, not to be, I earned my money, okay? <laughs> and then some, I mean, they got a lot out of me for not so much money. Mm -hmm. And at the end, like the interior design thing, I said, I can do this. I, I, I can do this. I'm running these guys anywhere. The plumber comes in. I stay there with them for a half a day. And the painter comes. I mix the colors with them. I, I know all these guys. I know all these subs. I want to do a house on my own. So I got together this group, architect, a very, very well-known architect in Marin, an excellent architect called Sutton Suzuki, give them a little plug there. They're really, really creative. And uh, Ron Sutton and I, and um, my husband, he's a finance guy. So he got the money for us. And I told my real estate agent, you gotta have one month to find me a house now. I mean, this is, this is 2000, 2000, 1999. The spec business or, the um, tech business is booming in the peninsula. Right. So I found this house. Is this interesting now or no? I find it extremely interesting. Okay. So I found this property in Mill Valley. It was on, um, first of all, it had land. So it was maybe three quarters of an acre. It was an old house from probably 1920 because Marin County was the vacation um, destination um, way back when, the, before the Golden Gate Bridge was built, they would take right. ferries over and, right. they, and they were summer awesome. homes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so um, I found this property and it was a teardown, but uh, anybody who does construction knows that if you tear down, you have to start off with the um, building department and um, all these other people and you have to get everything passed. And in Marin, that's not that easy. You know, everybody's got an opinion. Right. So, <laughs> so um, we left a lot of the house and we built onto it. And we took and we got a fair deal on the house. And um, it took six months or so. We got a loan from a company that did short-term financing, right? Um, they made big interest rates, but they were in and out and you were in and out. And that was the name of the game. Normal banks don't want to do this with developers too risky, right. but secondary money market people do. So we did that. It was a big hit. Uh, when we finished, it was a craftsman style because that's what was happening in Mill Valley. It had a creek running through it. It's a great story. You'll love it. So there I was every day. The architect did the plans. We got a builder. We went out to bid. We got a builder. I'm there every day with every sub and I'm in heaven. I just, you know, cause this is my thing. And I just prayed that the economy would hold together right. so that we can finish and make some money because you never know spec building can be right. Boomer bust. You can, you can lose your shirt on it. 
Yes. So all the builders I worked for <laughs> walked through it, and I heard one of them say before we sold it, "Well, if she gets this kind of money, this is this will be the first. And they were kind of like sour grapes. So when we did get that money, not only did we get one buyer, but three wanted it for cash. Yeah. Um, it was like the la it was like my swan song. You know, uh -huh. I said, okay, I'm finished. But no, we did look for some more properties, but there weren't any more to be had because now we were in competition with owner occupiers and, the, and from the tech industry and they would pay anything. Right. So they couldn't pick up any deals. Right. So I said to my husband, I think it's time to get out of here. And um, the other interesting thing that happened is I remodeled a house in Mill Valley up on Mount Tam for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it was a teardown sort of like that, but I left one big room. The house belonged to Anna Freud. So the Sigmund relation of Sigmund Freud. Freud. Yeah. Yeah. So rumor was she died in that house. I don't really know. But, you know, that was one of those summer houses. But she saw her patients there. She was, a, I guess, a psychotherapist, too. Mm -hmm. And when we bought it, you know, we tore most of it down. But there was a whole place where I think was her office. And she had all these locked drawers. Mm. You know, probably patient files or whatever. Probably. So, so the house had a history. And... Um, there were redwoods on the property and you could see Mount Tam and, the, and it was a fabulous place. Redwoods on the property and the rumor was that those redwoods built the house. And that's probably true. Yeah. And Mill, Mill Valley was called Mill Valley because there was a lumber mill in town. Mm -hmm. And the trees would come down in the old days from the mountain and they would mill them right there. And so that was your home that you built there and designed? Yeah, we built, I, I rebuilt it, you know, and the, the ridge beam in the living room was a redwood beam mm. and it was from the property and it was the longest be consecutive length beam I've pretty much ever seen. So we kept it. And so know. do you miss that house? I mean, yeah, you, know, you, yeah. you do. Yeah, I can I see do. that. I, I miss the house, but... It was the right time to leave the Bay Area. Um, the traffic, my subs didn't want to come into Mill Valley to work anymore because there's only two streets in and um, they would sit on that highway for half an hour trying to get into town. That's how bad the traffic got. And so what year did you leave the uh, San Francisco Bay Area? We left in uh, 2000. 2000, right as the bubble crashes. Right in there, well, right after well that. so what happened? So here's another good story if you're interested in this. So that house put on the market, um, cash offer from a, a couple that lived in Belvedere, which is one of the high, really high rent islands there in the Mill Valley area. Then 9-11 happened. We moved all of the furniture out of the house they bought it, contingent on the sale of their house, right? which was a biggie in Belvedere. Then 9-11 happened. We moved to Santa Fe with all our furniture. I stripped the house. Everything went because I thought this deal was done. Yeah. They, I got a call in, Mil in Santa Fe saying, we can't do the deal. So there we, <laughs> there we were. And I said, I'm not moving all this furniture back again. So my real estate agent said, no, no worries. I can sell it without it. I've got the pictures, you know, right. we had sale in a week ah. that went through. That was a tough week though. I'm sure before that. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, it was tough for everybody, right? Yeah, no, it was. I remember. I mean, well. and then I said at that point, cause we were going to build houses in Santa Fe in Las Campanas, spec houses. And we had right. a lot and we bought a house to live in. And I said to Vince, I'm not doing that now. I have no idea where this is going and it's too risky. And so we didn't, and I'm glad we didn't because we left there in 2005 and I did a little remodel on the place we lived in and we made money on it. And after that, nobody made any money pretty much. Yeah. No, yeah, I remember all that time. Well, so, and why did you pick Santa Fe? Was it because of the arts? 
I love Santa Fe, you know, for many reasons. It's, it's beautiful, as you know, it's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, the art. Um, Vince got into golfing. My husband became yeah. the big golfer. Uh, he got a hole in one recently. <laughs> Shout out to Vince. <laughs> <laughs> so my question after, to after his open heart surgery, mind you. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so when so, you so when you leave uh the bay area at that point did you go i think i need to start painting again or i need to start being looking at that more seriously so i i retired because i'd kind of had it you know i mean well yeah i wasn't going to do the spec building so there i was in, but i'm luckily in santa fe right right so i said oh so i'm walking down the street one day and i go past llewellyn when they were on Palace. Right. And I look in the window and there's a Sammy Peters. Do you know Sammy Peters work? No, I don't. Beautiful abstract, beautiful, big. I said, oh my God, look at that. I love it. And I had just, I was really flushed then. We'd sold that property in Mill Valley. Right. So, so I bought it. And um, and I'm looking at it, you know, and I'm going, geez, this is how I wish I could paint. To be honest, this is how I wish I could paint. And he painted in, um, you know, wax. Uh, what am I trying to say? Acoustic. Acoustic. He was did acoustic, which I tried and I didn't like. It's too. Um, you can't push it around enough. It dries too quick and it's it's too confining. Mm -hmm. Kind of like watercolor to me too. I like to be able to manipulate it for a while and stuff. But I looked at that painting and looked at it and I said, I'm gonna. I'm going to take a painting class again and, and learn these new acrylics because when I took painting back at the university, it was oil, you know, acrylic was a no, no and acrylic was plastic and all mm -hmm. of that. But now acrylics are not, they're wonderful. And really I, I had an experiment uh, in the class I took, I took it at artisans, you know, on Canyon. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. And they were still there and I learned the product line. And then I just said, well, I know the product line now. I want to ex just experiment on my own and see where I go. So he, Sammy Peters and Diebenkorn were my main influences, really. And if you look at my work today and you put a Diebenkorn and a Sammy Peters next to it, you're going to definitely see influence. Yeah, I definitely see the demon corn, but I don't know the other guy. Now I'm going to go look at him up. Well, you know what? I've got a painting in my home here, which before we get away here today, I'm going to walk into where it's hung. Okay. And I'll show it to you. So everybody I still have it. only listening to this, they need to check out the YouTube version too when they get done. Yeah. So, so anyway. When, so that's about 2001 or two when you <clears> start doing this? Yeah. And then um, I was painting, painting on my own. And one of the first paintings I did was kind of an abstracted um, landscape in a way. It, and I have it here too, if you're interested in seeing that. It's kind of interesting because that was the first pretty successful painting I did. But it, and it turned out nice, I'm happy with it. But I, did it, I knew then I don't wanna do landscapes. Right. I, and I did it from memory. And it's, it's redwood trees in the fog of Mill Valley. I did it from memory, mm -hmm. which is interesting. But you'll see when you see it how I could possibly do that from memory. Most people who paint landscapes have pictures, photographs they take. Yes. No, that's true. Yeah, it's much easier to have a reference. Yeah. To to yeah. Come out of your brain. So, so I did that. And then I'm, I have a little studio in, in Santa Fe in my home. And I'm painting, painting and trying to find my style, basically. Right. And in the beginning, you know, if you saw the work in the beginning, it's very different than where I ended up. Color-wise, the palette was pretty primary, not very sophisticated. I didn't really get into tertiary or secondary colors, and I didn't know about glazing. And, but I really, I'm really self-taught, actually. Mm -hmm. And, well, you and also it's just- did something with the Rhode Island School of Design, didn't you? Oh, that was just like a summer course. Yeah, and where was when was that when you were a kid? Oh, or let's see. Old? That must have been um, when I was still in school. Yeah, college in the summer. Just that was like a, a you know um, studio thing for a month or something. 
But this whole time you're working, you know, first of all, you're living in San Francisco area. Yeah. So you're getting the opportunity to look at art constantly. Yeah. And you're dealing with art every day of your job, basically. Right. You design, color, texture, architecture. You know, you have all that. That's what you do for 25 years, basically. Right. And then you make this jump. Do you think there was an epiphany there at some point that you go, this is what I need to be doing? Well, what happened was, um, I think it was just a natural progression, right? I mean, my, and this is why I went to abstract, I'm pretty sure, without knowing why, okay? Abstract to me is a mind thing about shapes, composition, palette, what goes with what, is this too much, is this too little? Is this too yellow, is this too green? Is this too, and all these questions I ask constantly while I'm painting. I just start, there's this huge, you can see this one behind me is like 84 by 70 or something. Mm -hmm. There's this huge canvas or board and I just start. And the only thing I decide is where am I going palette wise today? What do I feel like? Am I going to do reds? Am I going to be heavy in red and stuff? Or do I want a lighter palette? And I changed my palette over the years <clears throat> based on, and, and I think all art is this way now. Everybody kind of, it's a trend, you know what I mean? Like in the last four years, blues and whites and lighter things have become more predominant. Mm. And I like that palette myself. I went from a really strong, heavy, hot palette, yellows, reds, whatever, heavy, to a much lighter, but much more sophisticated in my own mind. And I, I, I use so many different techniques now than I did. Mm -hmm. But when I started out, I said, okay, well, I'm not gonna copy Sammy Peters or um, Diebenkorn. I just like what they're doing, as opposed to, Rothko or the guy that threw the paint, uh, Pollock. Pollock, or even uh, George O'Keefe, which are really abstracted landscapes, really, for the most part, or flowers mm -hmm. or whatever. I want to have a, my own unique style. It's very important to me to be unique or authentic in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't believe in copying or looking so much like somebody else that, you know, so I said, what can I do? And I said, I want to put papers in my paintings. Um, handmade papers. I'm, that's going to be my little niche. So I started collecting handmade papers. And I've incorporated them in not every painting. But I'll show you on this one. If, can we zoom in? No, you just have to take, you'll have to take the computer and get it closer. To oh. show. Okay, well... I'll show you in some places. But well, actually, what you can do, you don't even need to do that. We'll put an example. You can send us one, and we'll put it into the video. OK. So, you don't, so, so you don't even have to do that. So when you look at it in its entirety, and you zoom in on detail, you'll see papers. Yeah, you've done architectural drawings and things, too, that you've put into the. Yes. Yeah, so I did a series called Under Construction. Yes, that's right. Because you know, I have a lot of architectural plans I still have, and I have friends who are architects. And I thought that's kind of interesting because it was my career. So I cut up and tear up and whatever parts of plans, and I would incorporate them into a painting. And I thought it was very successful. Um, and I sold almost all of them. And then one day, Kathleen Sublet, or maybe it was you, <laughs> said, the Tucson, uh, University of Tucson art museum if i said that right museum mm -hmm. of art yeah the university of, yeah it's the u of a art museum mm -hmm. yeah is interesting they have a good collection she said and i had been down there and i knew it was and and they're interested in one of your pieces while i was floored I, I i said oh my god well that would be so wonderful and so i never expected anything like that of course my whole painting career i never expected to tell you the truth i just started right. painting for myself and then people saw the work and they said they wanted to buy it and so, and so well, I said, oh, God, here I am. That's how I met you, right? I mean, I met you at an art show. Yeah. It was art Santa Fe. Right. And um, 
you had already moved back, to, you'd gone to Tucson by then. And I remember walking through and they have some really good artists from all over the country and you had a booth with your paintings and, and I didn't know who you are or anything, but I, out of all the booths there and all the artists, you were the one that stuck out to me. I was like, yeah, that's great. Oh my God, this person's from Tucson. I didn't even know this person from Tucson. <laughs> <laughs> and the, and the, you're the best in the show. And uh, so Thank I you. That was you nice. Said, yeah, you know, I didn't have anybody who really painted like in an abstract form. And I like modern work just as much as I like uh, Western and native and approached you and said, hey, would you like to do it? And you said, I guess, I think at that point you said, sure, yeah, let me look at you. Let me see who you are again. I don't know if you knew who I was. Or well, not. then I said to myself, but he has Western art and he has landscapes. Right. Yeah, which is a natural thing to say, right? Right. But, but it's worked go, out. Oh, well. I've got Ed Mel too. <laughs> you yeah, know? but it's worked out well for us. And I would never have been in the Tucson University of Arizona Art Museum without you and Kathleen. Yeah, and, and Kathleen. she was really good at that. She was, and, and it's very hard to get into museums today. Very hard. Yes, it is. So if I never get into another one, well, that's okay. I don't really work at that, but um, Kathleen does. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's part of what you're supposed to do as a dealer, right? Is to yeah. help uh, facilitate. You're, unu you're unusual in that way. You really are unusual in that. Well, in many ways, but that's one of them. Well, it's important. You're building your artist's career, right? You're supposed to be helping them get to another level. And part of that is getting exposure to art shows and art museums and things like that. You can't, right. you know, that's, it's good for them. It's good for you. And it's good for the public. But honestly, there aren't that many dealers, maybe in New York, but there aren't that many dealers that I've experienced that are like that. Well, I think a lot of dealers look at it as a product and they're just trying to buy and sell. Right. I look at it as a relationship and something I'm trying to build over a decades, not months or weeks or anything right. like that. Right. Yeah. So, so I was lucky to find you and you found me and, you know. We were both lucky. <laughs> so anyway, um, where were we before that? Um, so you were oh, yeah, still so in Mexico. Santa Fe. So you were still in Santa Fe at that point. And yeah. you were and you stayed there till what, two oh five? Is that when you yeah. decided to move? And why and then did we you came move? And we, why did you go to Tucson? We left because we were, we can't build spec houses. Hmm. And we're too young to do. We we can't retire yet. We were too young. Yeah. So I said to Vince, well, you better find something to buy. You've got to buy a business. No one's going to hire you at 50. Right. And that's they're not. So he and a partner found a business in Tucson. Well, they looked all over the country. But Tucson was where this business was. And right. I didn't know it at the time, but he didn't want to be in the cold anymore. Mm. <laughs> I don't mind it, but he said no. So uh, we bought a business here and, you know, it's all worked out very well. It's very um, recession proof and uh, other things. Right. So that's how we ended up here. Now, I am not really a desert person and the heat I don't like. So we continue to go back to Santa Fe for four months every summer. Right. And, and you um, show yeah. there as well. You show at Ventana Gallery, right? And in, in, uh, I, I show at Ventana, yeah. And so um, I paint when I'm there and um, see the gallery and other things. And he golfs and we just enjoy the weather and the food and the people. Yes. And do you That's... paint every day? Are you out painting every day? No. I paint... <clears throat> I don't know. Sometimes I get in the mood where I don't want to paint for a while. I don't know why. I just right. you have to be in the mood to paint. You well, don't want it to be forcing yourself. Now, if the gallery calls me and says we just sold, I had a I had a show this summer and they sold a bunch of stuff, which was wonderful, through a Zoom a Zoom interview show. Yeah. And so I needed to replace what they sold. So I'm painting for that. Yes. You know. Well, and I think it, you know, maybe abstract art is a little different than representational art, that there is maybe a more of an emotional pull that you have to tap into. I find that with writing some, you know, they say you should write every day, and I think that is the best way. But there are times that you go through periods that you just may not have the energy and or the creative juice to do it. I, think right. I, find, that, I find that it sometimes goes in uh, streaks where yeah. you're just get into that rhythm and then you're going, right? And that's like, all you that's right. Like during COVID, 
when I was getting ready for the show, I painted almost every day. Yes. You know, um, and I, you know, I guess I got six paintings done in a few months or three months. Yeah, and, and COVID for me shut me down creatively from a writing standpoint, interestingly enough. So. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't me because I was housebound, you know? Yeah. And I wasn't running around anywhere. So I took the energy and did that. Yeah, I think I just pushed it to my business to make it better and to work on yeah. other things that really, they are creative, like an online magazine and an online auction that I developed and a jewelry line too. I don't even know if you knew this, but we started a jewelry line. Which, oh, no, I didn't. Yeah, that'll open. We have put it out next week. Yeah. Who's designing it? So Sam Patania is doing the, the work, the design. He and I are working together on this. Uh -huh. So I've had great stones that I've put away for decades that I've been waiting for the right person to give them to. And then I thought, well, why don't I, well, actually with my son's advice, I said, why don't, you know, make your own yeah. line. So yeah. that's what I'm doing. I'm making my own line and uh, which gets, it's fun. It's creative. I get to do, be involved in Sam Patania is an amazing silversmith, third generation. And, you know, so it's. And, uh, you know, yeah. it's, all, it's all marketing too. I mean, I market as well as I, no, I don't, I, I shouldn't say that. I market, at my age, I market, which works for me. If I were 20 years younger or 30 years younger, I'd be all over the internet. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But I am not, I'm retarded technically in a way. <laughs> and so I am not all over the internet. The galleries have to do it. Right. But that's what I a good gallery should do, right? Just painting, good galleries, you, know. you know, good galleries should be doing that for their artists. They should right. be promoting them in different formats, you know, this is one way to, to, uh, prom to promote somebody, but I don't actually do this as a promotion for my gallery and my artists. It just happens that does occur. I do it for the creative bent, right? I really enjoy, you know, interviewing different people, uh, other dealers, collectors, artists. I think I interviewed three artists this last week, none mm -hmm. of which I represent. And Oh, really? Uh, yeah, it doesn't matter to me. It's the stories that I'm interested in. Yeah. Quite frankly, um, yeah. how you became who you are. I mean, you have an interesting ride, right? I mean, you're very successful in a creative area, but you switch gears and you completely now go into art. And right. So I said, I, there. so I said at that point, okay, well, not going to build houses, don't want to do interior design anymore. I'm going to paint. I'm going right. to paint just as a hobby. But then they wanted to buy them. And I said, okay, well, I have a new career now. Right. <laughs> but, but, but the interesting part about all that is I painted for five years before, because I'm very, um, hmm, I have to be proud of what I'm doing, really proud and happy and so satisfied. I can't just go say, oh, here's some art. Do you want to have it and hang it? Right. So I had to really be, and I'm my own worst critic. So I had to really feel somewhat good about the work. That I so then I hit the street with my portfolio. Yeah, and, how do you do that? Uh, I think other artists would find it interesting because, you know, you're you 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 have your degrees in art and architecture and things, but maybe not a fine art degree in studio. Right. Arts. right. So and now you've been painting for five years. You have a body of work. You've right. been to the point where you're happy. You feel good about it. How right. do you get into that next group? So, I, mean, I know how I found you, but how did you oh, do it? Right. So all the books say, make an appointment at a gallery. They don't like you walking in. Mm -hmm. I did anyway. <laughs> because galleries are tough. You know, they're tough. There's a lot of artists out there, some very good artists today, and it's very um, competitive. And galleries tend to have their, you know, stable of artists, and they want to be loyal to them in a way, I found. That's and good. if my work was too close to somebody that they already had, they wouldn't take me because, well, they'll be stepping on the toes of the person they already have. So um, I took my portfolio and I walked into, actually, it doesn't matter where I say where I went or not. No, go ahead. I walked into Llewellyn because. Yeah, sure, why not? They're, they're a great gal. Llewellyn was it, you know. Yeah, they, I, get, I get that. And I met this wonderful man who was curator there, I think. And um, I approached it in a little different way. I mean, obviously I walked in there because I would 
I didn't really think they'd take me, but because they have some very well-known artists and I'm young and I was not young, but I was, you know, emerging portfolio. And I could see halfway through the portfolio that this guy was interested. And then he said, well, where do you live? And I said, well, now I live in Arizona, but I used to live here and la la la. And he said, we'd like to try it. Well, I did my happy dance when I left there. I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. Right. So, but, but that was a, not a good period because that was 2008. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. And the, it was right before they left that space, I think, and moved to the rail yard. Right. And he, and he, ne he never sold the piece because I was only there for about a year and a half. And nobody was buying art. Nobody right. was buying art yeah, then. 2009 was really tough. And yeah. I, I was a gallerist in that area in Santa Fe, and I can, you know, test yeah. it was not an easy yeah. year. So he said to me, I'm sorry, but you were one of the last ones we, we took, and, and I'm doing it that way. So if this wasn't this time, I would never let you go. But, and I understood, you know. So um, that was how I got into a first gallery. And then when I moved to Tucson, that was a little easier because the competition wasn't so stiff here. Right. And I had, I've been in about three galleries here. Yeah. Um, but I had to find you in Santa Fe. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Well, you know, that's kind of funny in a way because you were up where Jane Hamilton is. Yes. At right. one point. Yes, I was. I did have and a secondary I, gallery. And I think I was there then. Could be. But you maybe never went in there. No, I never did. Okay, and, so. And that's one of the problems with having multiple galleries, right? Especially if they're multiple galleries in the same town, you basically stick to the gallery that's closest and the biggest. Mm -hmm. And occasionally you go up for shows or whatever to the other one. And that, that's a problem. And you have to have a really dynamic, you know, manager and you, you know, it's just, it's an issue. Right. When so the gallery, that. the gallery business is, um, was to when I first, encountered it, I thought, oh God, you know, this is not very professional. <laughs> I mean, I was used to interior design and big showrooms with a lot of money and people with marketing degrees and people with business degrees uh, right. running these things. And I was not prepared for what I found. Yeah. Until I met you guys. <laughs> you, honestly, you restored my faith in the whole thing. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, we do run it professionally. I mean, I guess coming as at, coming at it from being physicians, that we realize there's certain things you have to do, you know, just from business wise, right? As, right. as a physician, you have to have all your charts, you know, in a line. You have to document things. You have to do things um, in a certain standard. You know, there's a certain standard. I didn't see anything different. In, in transferring that same kind of thing to, from medicine to art. You do the same right. kind of thing, right? Good records, right. good bookkeeping, don't right. make mistakes, have high ethics, all that kind of stuff. Well, then when I uh, was lucky enough to get into Vantana in Santa Fe, I knew uh, one of the gals that was a um, salesperson there. She had her own gallery at one point, but a lot of them folded in 2008 and nine. Yeah, they did. And so, but, but Vantana and Connie, they, she's survived there a long time. And I knew that, and I wanted to be there because it's a big, big space and my work needs a big space. It does. I can't yes. have a little Adobe eight, no. eight foot tall ceiling space, doesn't work. Yeah. So I was lucky to get in there and Connie has been running that gallery a long time and, and she knows what she's doing. Yeah. So and, I feel and very so now you're basically showing in two galleries. Is that pretty much it? Yeah, that's it. Yep. Yeah. I and tried I think... Denver. Mm -hmm. I didn't have much luck there. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I think Denver people come to Santa Fe to buy art. They don't yeah. really, I mean, there's a few. Michael Sachs is a very good gallery that does very well in Denver. But as a general rule, I think a lot of gallerists, uh, collectors, you know, it's only five hours to Santa Fe. So they go, well, let's go and buy art. And they just... Right. Do that. I sold a lot of art to Tucsonians in Santa Fe that never bought from me in Tucson. Well, you know, I see where they buy at, at Ventana. I sell pretty well there. And I see where they come from. They come from all over. This summer I had Florida, California. I get a lot from California, actually. Um, 
I guess I've had some Denver, Texas. Yeah. Is a biggie. Oklahoma, I sold a big commission to somebody in Oklahoma. Yep. yep. So Santa Fe is a, a great art market, let's face it. it. Although, you know, recently with COVID and, and it's, a, it's a hard business, you know, it's a hard business. Very competitive in Santa Fe, first of all. There's so many art galleries. Well, there are, but just the business itself, you know, when the economy isn't roaring or you have something like COVID or 9-11, it, it, yep. it, it, that, then, then that income, that disposable income, people get tight with it. Yes. Don't they? Well, for oil and gas especially, it affects the Santa Fe market a great deal. Uh -huh. So it's probably the biggest barometer of, of sales because if, you know, the oil and gas individuals, if they're not making money or afraid, they're not going to be buying. So that cuts out a huge amount of sales in Santa Fe. I mean, I just saw that over the years. I mean, I was there for 20 years, so I followed that market. <laughs> Yeah. very closely. So I find actually the Tucson market to be much better than the Santa Fe market, quite frankly, for me. Uh-huh. Well, I could see that, though, because of the buyer here. You know, there's a lot of people that are still interested in um, Western art and landscape. And I, I, I think this is a hard, harder abstract market. It is, but that'll change. You think Time so? Changes. Oh, absolutely. 100%, without mm -hmm. a doubt. Yeah, because you have more influence, more people like from California that are coming in and they're yeah. building more contemporary modern homes and they want modern art. Yes. So I have found, though, that people, a lot of collectors, unless they studied somewhere uh, abstract art, don't really understand abstract art that much. And but when but when they're educated about it, it changes the whole perception. Yeah, that's true. Like I did that Zoom interview this summer and I heard from the gallery that people loved hearing how I put a painting together, you know? And they decided to buy one when they heard it. Because some people have this notion that abstract art is <laughs> a kindergartner could do it. <laughs> well, I'm here to tell you they cannot. Right. <laughs> And I'm here to tell you that when I taught painting, I'd, I'd get some realism painters in my classes and some of them would leave in tears because they thought it was going to be a no brainer. Right. And there were yeah. good realism yeah. painters, but they couldn't do abstract. And I don't, I, I find that um, interesting, but not unusual. Yeah. Francis Livingston, who is known more for <clears throat> his Western scenes and his cityscapes also does abstract. And is very and very gifted in it. But he's told me they take just as much time, if not more, to do his abstract paintings as they do a big one with, you know, trees and aspens right. and native. Well, you, you know. have a you have a goal and you have an end with a landscape. It's a matter of putting it together. With abstract, it could never end. I mean, you you can go and go and it and you'll change the painting and it can keep changing. I finish a painting and I'll hang it. Be, because I know in my brain that it's not quite there and I don't know why. And I'll right. walk past it for like two, three weeks. And one day I look at it and I know what's wrong. Yeah. And I fix it. Well, Agnes so. Martin, who, you know, did minimalist paintings, she would paint like five paintings and then she would only pick two of them out of the who five. Is this? Who? Agnes Martin, who does very, Agnes Martin, who was a modernist, who was in Taos in New York. Um, and does these line paintings and she would destroy the other three. So, you know, out of five paintings, only two might make it. If there was any, any little bit of what she would consider uh, not being up to her standards, whether the art was puddling a little bit, some of the paint, mm -hmm. she would get rid of these. And she would get rid of them when she was selling these things for, you know, half a million dollars. They're worth millions now. And she would still destroy them. So, you know, it's, you, you set your standards to what you want and what you feel is, you know, what you want to let out of the studio. I mean, basically, and any painter who, who's telling him the truth will tell you this, abstract anyway. If, let's say you paint 50 paintings, and I'll bet you that of those 50 paintings, 15 are really, really good in your own mind. The rest are nice and they're good, but they're not really, really good. Right. This guy, and those really, really good ones, I don't sell them. Yeah. <laughs> I will someday, but there's one right behind me here. It's a really <laughs> good painting. And I have a few like that, that I don't sell. 
So when because. somebody listens to this po- or watches this podcast and sees that painting and wants it, you come to me. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll twist your arm. We'll see. Well, <laughs> well, I have been known to do things like, um, this is funny. I had a painting that went into a local magazine. It was a designer showcase house, you know, yeah. and they put it on the cover, the room with my painting. And the gallerist called me and said, now the client of the owner of that home wants to buy that painting now because they saw it in their house. Right. I said, well, I don't have it anymore. <laughs> and she said, what? And I said, well, I painted over it because if I've got a painting around for a couple of years and it, maybe it went to the gallery and it didn't sell, I, I look at it and I say, oh, I'm doing things differently now. I'm going to rework this. And I use the underpainting as part of the new painting and it makes it interesting. But I said, no sweat, I can paint that again. Yeah. And I can actually add a few colors that she might want in there being an interior designer. Right. And I did. And and if you put those two paintings together, the picture of the one I repainted and the new one, it's right. very hard to tell. Yeah, which is really interesting because it is so emotionally driven, these abstract paintings that you could still do that. Well, yeah, but once you've done it, you yeah, know how you right. did it. Yeah, you know? right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I say to you, you can't have this one, but you can have one very similar. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now you we're kind of getting finished toward the end of this, but you've okay. been doing this now for 20 years as an artist. And uh, what would your recommendation to other artists, maybe especially artists that are coming into it later in life that have the talent, maybe went to art school, but haven't done it for 20 years, but they want to really take it up seriously like you have. Mm-hmm. What recommendations would you say to them? Well, if they don't paint, if they're new to painting, they have to take some classes. They have to learn the product line, whether it's oil or acrylic. And I highly recommend acrylic today because I really do. Golden acrylics is all I use. And that's what I want my uh, my students to use because the product line line you're talking about is they need to know their their paints. They need to know the colors and the types that they can. They need to know how to mix paint. They, They need to know a lot of stuff. They yeah. need to know composition. They, and, and it's, uh, I've had some students that have taken from me for maybe three years. And these are people that are taking, you know, once a week. So four times a month for three hours each time. Mm. And they, and, and it takes years to get good. Yeah. It does. Yeah, 10,000 hours. It, I don't know how many, but it, yeah, it does. Take, it. <laughs> it, it takes years to get good. And, um, Believe it or not, the most successful students I've had have been from medicine. Yeah, I can see that. Well, they have they have some things that are uh, helpful for that. They they have t- determination and they set goals. So well, they won't, and isn't they it a left up. brain right brain thing too? Yeah, there is. There's you, you see a lot of music and art uh, and medicine. They go together for sure. My my sister was a classical violist. Oh. For, for you know, 15 years, and then went, and now she's a you know an MD, PhD in medicine. So she switched. Mm-hmm. So I mean, you do see that you know right brain, left brain, and I'm not exactly sure why that is, mm-hmm. but I do think it's more than that, just that too. But I, I do think you need to have the the temerity. You have to have that drive to not give up when you fail, right? Because you're going to fail. Right. Yeah. The and drive you, to succeed. Yeah. yeah. You failed, I'm sure many times on many paintings and there at some point you may have said my god i don't know if i have what it takes but i'm going to keep going yeah and that's that's true and experimentation to find your uh, authentic style is important it's your really voice. important and that takes time right it really does take time and i'm at a place today where i feel how can i say this I'm happy with where I'm at in my career, painting wise, yeah. my, my, my techniques. I'm, I'm really happy now, but I wasn't all the, I wasn't for a long time. I just kept going, you know? Yeah, that's right. You, <laughs> you kept pushing it and kept doing it and having right. your own business, I think helps in this too, because, you know, you know, the struggles that are out there and in some respects, it's a different kind of struggle and maybe even a, I don't know if it's an easier struggle, but it's you, you've overcome those in the past. Right. And, you know, for anybody thinking about abstract painting, 
if I had to describe how I uh, approach it or how I feel about it, it's it's an experiment. That canvas is an experiment for me in how how everything works together and the relationship between all these things. Not only color, but composition and the papers and making it interesting, but not overwhelming and making it not boring, but you know, like my paintings are, have so many layers in them that you can look at it one day and, and the, the next day you'll see something else. Yes. So I encourage people who think they can do it, go try it and see how well it looks. I've tried it before, not that easy. <laughs> No. And the problem for me, of course, is I know what good abstract art looks like. And right. so I'm looking at what I've done and going, this is complete garbage. Um. <laughs> now, my, my daughter is an art, my, well, she doesn't, she works as an event planner, but she's very artistic. And all through school, there, all the art teachers are pushing her to do it. And she can draw like nobody's business. Yeah. And she can't paint abstract. Yeah, it's very difficult. Yeah. Totally frustrated with it. So yeah, it is frustrating because well, it's really frustrating if you can recognize what good art looks like, and you you have no ability to try to put that down, translate it to the canvas. You you might think you could. Yeah. I I uh, defy anybody who thinks they can do this to just go and try it, try it, and then yeah. put it on the wall and see if somebody who understands art likes it or not. They're, yeah. They're not because it yeah. takes. It takes 10,000 hours. It takes a lot of time and energy to get to that point. And I've said this before, but I'll say it again. I like challenging my brain at this point in my life in this mm. way. I think it's good for us, don't you, as a doctor? Yeah, of Absolutely. And it keeps those connections of left and right brain going. Absolutely. Right. Very important. It's important for anyone who's in that aging process to be engaged, to be challenged, to, you know, whether it's creativity or philanthropy or, uh, you know, just reading, whatever, you have to stay engaged. You know, it's important. That's how you keep myelin. You know, you keep laying down myelin and you want to have that for your neurological connection. Oh, is, that, is that it? <laughs> is that that's what it is? It. That is what it is. It really is. I mean, that's the insulator of your of your nerves. So not to go too far so off the that, art track. You think that all of, the, uh, all of us who paint abstract will not get dementia? Well, I can't say that, but I think you have a better chance of putting things like that off. I think it, I do think. Really? It oh, I do. I really do. Yeah. Yeah. And you see a lot of artists, you know, look at like Wayne Tebow. I mean, he just turned a hundred and Gregory Condos is almost a hundred. They're still painting, still uh -huh. active, still engaged. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously some of that's genetic, but they're still painting beautifully. Mm -hmm. you know? So, you know, doing that, I think is, is critical and, uh, you know, you have to do all the other stuff, but yeah, for sure. And they're happy, right? It keeps you, you know, when you can create whatever yeah. that may be, there's yeah. something wonderful and beautiful about being able to make something that, um, you know, no one else could do. And quite frankly, for some artists, they can make as a beautiful, something that's beautiful that was a, even better than they were 30 years ago. And maybe they're 80 and they're still painting. At a level yeah, well, that painting. should. I think that should be the way because every year you're painting, you're getting better and you're learning more. Yeah. You know? So you want to I show learned, us on a. Go, go I learned something new on every painting, to tell you the truth. I believe that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of artists keep all their studies. You know, landscape artists, you know, the Matt Smiths of the world. They don't get rid of their beautiful little plain air paintings. They want to keep them because mm -hmm. they are reference they can remember that sense the color the light and then they have a reference to it you know so yeah i, I agree now do you want to show us for those who are listening to it we're going to take a quick tour of the gallery so you may want to click off at this point but do you want to show us some of that stuff you said you had in your studio painting one yeah now you know I'm going to pick this laptop up and I'm hoping that nothing happens because if well, I push we'll a button, if I push a button, I might not know how to get back. So we'll, well try that, it. So if we'll we get, try it. we get cut off. Oh, well, that was the end of our Martha <laughs> Braun interview, but we're going to, for those people, yeah, we can see, just pick up the computer, take it. And we're going to walk through, we get to see some of the. Okay. Artwork. So you tell me when you can see, do you yeah, see, we can see everything? No, that's beautiful. Yeah, no, yeah. that shows the, the artwork. We can see it. So that's the one you were sitting behind, right? Yeah, and, yeah. 
And then let's see, you were gonna show us some other earlier stuff. Oh yeah, oh, so here we go. You're gonna get dizzy now. So this, can you see this? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a collage looking of multiple imagery. Yeah, yes. so mm -hmm. I'm never gonna do another one. It took me a thousand hours to do this. Yeah, wow. I started. I started out wanting to do something that was industrial and 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 handcrafted looking. So I mounted these hand painted paper paintings that yeah. I did on a sheet of plexi. Yeah, I remember seeing this actually in your house. I've seen and it. I screwed all those little paintings in these tiny screws. <laughs> it took forever. Yeah, but Perfect. everybody likes it. But you know. Yeah. That'll be well, that. You just, to, you just have to charge them more if it's a thousand dollars. <laughs> you can sell that if you want, Mark. Okay, I will. It's available right now. Yeah. Okay, so here is Sammy Peters. Oh, yeah, I can see it. Wow. Oh, yeah, I get it now. Yeah, yeah. That was the one that started me painting. Yeah, I see it. Yeah, I see it. Can, yeah. can you also see some um, Vibin corn in that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I sure mm -hmm. can. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, so that was that. And then um, the last one I'll sh show you is the first painting I did. Let's see if we get a little light on this. That was an abstract, really. Can you see that? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember seeing this. Yeah, it's a beautiful landscape. Did I lose you? No, you're fine. Uh-oh. Yeah. No. no. Did I lose you? No. We can, I did. We, we, no, you didn't. What do, what do I do now? You. What do you do now, Martha? Darn. Well, there you are. We see you, Martha. Okay, so can, let's see. I can hear you and see you. Yeah, there you go. For a yep. minute, I, I lost you. What does it say here? Your internet. Uh, you're fine. Connection. You're fine. Awesome. All right. Yeah, just just show it. That's fine. Just to, can right you there. see that? Oh. Yeah. Right. So yeah, I can see that. Is that? Is, oh, that's one of the Marin Woods that you. That's the redwoods. Redwoods in the fog from Mill right. Valley. Yeah, I can see it. Oh, yeah, it's beautiful. And why didn't you want to continue on that lane? It just didn't move you enough? I mean, because that's a very successful painting. It wasn't challenging enough for me, these landscapes. I see. All I had to do was, I mean, you have to be a really good technician to paint a real realistic landscape. And you have to have, in my case, I tried to abstract this a little bit, which I'm sure I did, you know. Um, but after it was done, I said, oh, well, that's pretty, but it didn't excite me. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't your voice. You needed to find something else, but that's technically a very good painting. So point, point your thing at you again. So we'll see. Oh, there's another beautiful painting. This is another abstract. This is a that's diptych. a diptych and that's a really old piece. That thing's probably 15 years old, let's say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can see where, how far you've come from that painting. Yeah. Yep. Very there's much a so. lot of paper in there though. You see, when I move up, do you see that paper? It looks like hieroglyphics. Yeah, you can see it. Yeah, you can see the texture of this. So yeah. we're looking at a painting, an abstract painting with that's papers laid down and then painted over that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I lay the paper down and then I integrate it into the painting. All right. So where are we headed on this roller here? Back to so where we're going to go. We're going back to, we'll go show you two more and then that'll be good. Okay. <clears throat> so anybody who's seeing her now we get to see your beautiful house too yeah so here's a good e example of how abstract paintings can work with more con more traditional furnishings here's a french armoire right do you see that yeah that's off to the left uh -oh. you're, you're, you're you're no you can, we can Lost still you hear you we can still hear you martha so yeah, you, see you see it. Mm -hmm. I wonder what happens. No, it's be... just the interconnect. It's your internet connection slows up occasionally. So, can you so, can you see that? No, you put your finger over the camera. I think. <laughs> <laughs> now I can. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is an example how there's a French armoire, 1840, yeah. and there's an abstract painting. Yeah, no, of course it works. You know, I live in a contemporary home, but I have Native American Western art in my home that works beautifully so right i uh, like i like the eclecticness of of the combination yeah yeah you i know? think that's right people are afraid sometimes oh i'm in a contemporary home it has to be all contemporary art or i'm in a western adobe home and it has to be all native or western no 
it just needs to be good. That's your criteria. It needs to be good. Right. And then there's a point where you need to be able to, uh, you know, put them together where they're compatible. But, you know, there's no reason why you can't do both. All right, let's just have your face there. Let's look at your face again. Otherwise, we're going to just see mine. I see your eyes. <laughs> I'll just talk. Well, there we go. All, all I see in front of me is a bunch of little tiles. Microsoft yeah. Office, la la la. I have yeah. no idea. Well, don't worry about it. I'll just talk, and we'll end up from here. But I think one of the the takeaways from this talk is to not only the painting history and what you need to do as an artist and how you can go about, you know, looking at your dream, even if you're older, but also somebody who's looking at for design of their home and wants to know, okay, how can I uh, incorporate modern art with maybe a traditional home? It's easy enough to do. So there we go. Yep. Yeah. So, you, so there's you one last thing I'm going to show you right. because uh -huh. this is, this is a painting of how I feel about the internet. Okay. <laughs> All right, so for those of you like who are it. not on, we're taking a walk. Those of you who are on YouTube, you're looking at me, otherwise you'll be just looking at the top of a roof. So, okay, let's see your internet painting. There they are. Okay. Can you, are you seeing them? I do, yeah, I see them. The so, or can, those are called yeah. internet connection. <laughs> those also look like neuronal connections, by the way, of your brain. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. really? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, there we go. Okay, that's my show and tell. All right, very good. Thank you, Martha, very much for coming and speaking with us today and taking the time. I know you didn't want to really do this, but I thought you were fantastic. You can just stop right there and quit walking and just stand right there and we'll have a nice offset. All right, Martha Braun, thank you very much. We look forward to uh, having you get back into the gallery once things get a little less crazy. Martha right. Braun on the Art Dealer Diaries. Thank you. Thanks. Talk to you soon. All right. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. We need your support for the Medicine Man Gallery channel, so make sure to click the subscribe button and tap the little bell icon to be notified when we upload a new video, which we do every morning on Wednesday and Friday. See you soon.